welcome or welcome back. It's good to see you. I hope you're doing well today. My name is Vix and this is my channel Goddess of Gore where I like to talk about horror, thriller, fantasy and sci-fi books. Today I want to talk about the Locus Magazine Awards for 2023 in the horror category. Now this award ceremony has already happened but I didn't get all of the shortlist books read until last week or so so I have been avoiding Twitter like the plague so I could make this video and keep it as a genuine surprise. So shall we see who got nominated before I make my own choice who I think will win and then finally we'll have a look together and find out who actually won shall we? A little background the Locus Awards have been around since 1971 and back then there were no genre categories just a novel short fiction and anthology award but today it gives out the award for science fiction fantasy young adult novella novelette non-fiction and so many others but since the year 2017 it has had its own category for horror and specifically what its readers want to nominate as the best horror of the previous year. So yeah, unlike so many other awards you don't have to be a paid member of anything to get a vote, it's an open vote. You just download the very substantial paperwork, fill it in and send it back to cast your vote. This year the ceremony took place on the 24th of June in California and the nominated horror novels were No Gods for Drowning by Hayley Piper, The Fervor by Alma Katsu, The Devil Takes You Home by Gabino Iglesias, Just Like Home by Sarah Gailey, What Moves the Dead by T. Kingfisher, The Paul Bearers Club by Paul Tremblay, Sundial by Catrona Ward, Saturnalia by Stephanie Feldman, Gwendy's Final Task by Stephen King and Richard Chismar, Road of Bones by Christopher Golden and Echo by Thomas Old Huvelt. So before I talk about the books I will just say that I did a Bram Stoker Award prediction video last month and there were a couple of crossovers so I won't talk too much about those so if you want a better synopsis for Sundial the Devil Takes You Home and The Fervor, then you can go and watch that because I will be brief about them this time. So very quickly, those three books then. Sundial is a psychological horror thriller mystery that is so amazingly well written. Honestly, the writing is exquisite and so easy to immerse yourself in heads up I'm probably going to end up saying that about quite a few of these books to be honest but they just were so this is about a woman called Rob who takes her daughter Callie back to her parental home in the dusty desert in the middle of nowhere Callie has been acting very strange recently talking to thin air dissecting animals for their bones and displaying them and Rob decides enough is enough when Callie begins to hurt her younger daughter Annie. Rob needs to tell Annie all about her heritage and needs to take her back to Sundial, the home, to do it. Over the course of I think it is one night, the story flits between the past and the present as Rob comes clean about the terrible past that has resulted in the family what it is today. Honestly, that isn't the best description in the world, but if you haven't read this book, you really should. I sat on it for a whole year and probably wouldn't have read it if it wasn't for any of these awards, but you really should. The same can be said for The Devil Takes You Home by Gabino Iglesias. The book floored me. I could not believe I had found two amazing books. This is about a man called Mario who has just lost his daughter to leukemia, lost his job halfway through her treatment, up to his eyeballs in debt and then not long after he loses his wife after a fit of rage she walks out. What else does he have then? A friend who introduces him to drugs. Great! Can't move for debt companies wanting their money but he buries his head in the sand and by sand I mean drug induced ignorance until he can't hide any longer. He has to start paying up so he starts to do hitman jobs. A couple here, a couple there, nothing too bad. I mean they're bad guys, they deserve it right? 
until his friend and his drug dealer come up with an amazing money-making scheme. They're going to rob some dealers and mules, moving a huge amount of drugs into America from Mexico. And they'll never need to do another job again. It's going to be big. More money than they've ever seen. Mario thinks this is a stupid idea. So many flaws. But does it anyway? Hey, what else has he got to lose? What follows is the worst ever road trip buddy novel that you will ever read. It is gory. It is gross. It is horrific. It's amazing. And then The Fervor by Alma Katsu is a historically accurate event twisted into a horror theme. If you don't know, this is pretty much what Alma does. She's very clever. She's very clever at giving horror fans a history lesson. This time they have taken the moment in American history in 1944 and the roundup of its Japanese citizens when it, America basically put them into work camps, aka concentration camps and treated them as if they were all spies for Japan for no other reason than they have Japanese heritage. This actually happened less than 80 years ago in America and so Alma included a Japanese folk folklore spider demon Jorogumo in this as a way to infest the story. I found this to be a little confusing following the various points of view and didn't really find the horror simply because there wasn't enough moments that involved this Jorogumo. It took a very minor role and I wanted more from it but kudos to Alma for the history lesson since this was something I had no idea about. So the others then, No Gods for Drowning by Hayley Piper. This was also a very confusing book with too many characters and some very wild wild fantasy lore. I couldn't keep track of events but it did have some pretty good body horror. It reminded me of a Sarah J Mass novel and I'm I'm not a fan really to say it rather mildly and although I have loved Hayley Piper's work before I was not a fan of this. This is a fantasy detective novel set in a miserable world whose inhabitants have been left by its gods. The world is drowning one tidal wave at a time and a kind of army police kind of thing is going from town to town trying to beat the rains and the flooding by evacuating its citizens. Along the way we meet private detectives who are investigating a series of human sacrifices and we also get to meet the person doing the sacrifices. But they all know each other in some kind of way. The sacrifices are very well described and in my opinion the best thing about the book because I thought the rest of the book was just too dramatic and angsty for me. But as I mentioned in my wrap up of the book, Hayley has done a wonderful job in creating the priestess Lilac. Her character was tremendous and most likely the only other thing that kept me invested in this book. Maybe I wasn't the target audience. As I said, this reminded me so much of the Crescent City series that I think it's probably a new adult kind of book. Just Like Home by Sarah Gailey. Oh, let me tell you about Just Like Home. This was an absolute thrill ride. I was completely hooked from the very first page and couldn't tear my eyes away until I reached its gripping conclusion. Right from the start, you get the sense that something horrific, something very wrong has occurred in Vera's past, causing her and her family to become outcasts in their own town. A few of the locals we do meet in the book treat them with sheer hostility but surprisingly we do not witness too many pitchfork wielding town folks throughout the story. The details of what actually happened to bring about this abhorrence from the neighbours are somewhat teasing, leaving us hungry for more. So Vera is returning to her childhood home where her father was once arrested for a string of murders. Her mother who has remained there all these years is now on her deathbed and urgently calls Vera in to help putting things in order before she passes away. It is clear that her mother fears for Vera's safety once she's gone and urges her to leave town as soon as possible. Vera has always felt incredibly alone in her life, being an only child with parents who were marked as social outcasts. Her own quirks and obsessive behaviours didn't help matters either. And we get a glimpse of a childhood friendship which turned sour. That a friendship that went so 
terribly wrong. But throughout the book, we catch glimpses of what her father was doing when she was a young girl. Things that deeply disturbed her and altered the course of her life. Despite everything, Vera holds a deep affection for her father who was her sole source of parental love and it appears her mother loved him too despite the unspeakable acts that occurred within their home. I couldn't help one but wonder if there was more to her involvement than met the eye originally. But something unsettling lingers within the house. What that is remains a mystery until the final few chapters. When Vera's father was arrested, the town became a magnet for death tourists, eager to catch a glimpse of the infamous murder house. And Vera's mother capitalised on this once Vera had left home. This decision didn't sit well with the neighbours who were also victims of her husband's heinous crimes. And to make matters worse, the son of the author who wrote her father's biography, James, now takes up residence in the guest lodge within the garden. I really didn't like him. He was a smug little git. I get a lot of people's negativity towards this book not being graphic enough, but I really enjoyed the peep show aspect of the historic crimes. Some of the details are definitely left to the reader's own imagination. What Moves the Dead by T. Kingfisher. Now, I do loves me a T. Kingfisher book, but this was the first of their horrors that I wasn't quite taken with. It was absolutely stunning, but it didn't creep me out like the others. I am not a Poe fan with what little I have read, so I don't think that that helped with this retelling of Poe's Fall of the House of Usher. This is the very definition of a slow burn, a gothic horror novella that revolves around Alex Easton, a retired soldier who receives a letter from their friend Madeline Usher begging for help before she dies. Prompted by concern, Alex rushes to the Usher estate where they encounter a decaying gothic manor and the emaciated Usher siblings. Perplexed by their deteriorating health and the mysterious glowing lake on the property, Alex joins forces with an American doctor and the local mycologist to uncover the truth. The atmosphere of the decrepit manor and the unsettling Usher siblings creates an eerie setting, making this a little no novella just dripping and seeping pure gothic. Next up, uh, Saturnalia by Stephanie Feldman. Wow, I think this was the lowest rated out of the 11 books nominated. I really didn't enjoy this one. The synopsis sounded like it was going to be a lot of fun, but I just didn't vibe with it at all. So I will first tell you what the book promised. Nina, having distanced herself from the elite Saturn Club and its occult activities, now earns a living by fortune telling with her Saturn Club tarot deck. However, when her last remaining friend Max calls her for a favour, Nina is drawn back into the enigmatic world of the Saturn Club. Donning a black dress, Nina goes to the extravagant solstice party, unaware that she will uncover power struggles amongst secret societies. She becomes the guardian of a terrifying secret and the target of a mysterious hunter as Nina runs through an alternate Philadelphia, teetering between celebration and catastrophe. She confronts her past to secure the future for all, her journey through the streets takes her past parades, worship houses, museums, hidden mansions, as well as the place she once considered home, revealing a world on the brink of change. But what I actually got was a story that lacked depth. The mythology and alchemy never quite hit the mark for me and the characters seemed to lack any actual life and I felt like the main character was preoccupied with being wronged in life and ended up being disliked instead of cheered on. And by the end of the book, well, I really didn't care one way or the other what the outcome of the quest was. I didn't care if even every single person in the story died, quite frankly. Gwendy's final task, this third instalment of the Button Box trilogy, follows the life of Gwendy Peterson, who once encountered a mysterious 
box at the age of 12 filled with both temptations and deadly consequences. While this can be enjoyed as a standalone novel, I must admit that having read the previous two books would have enhanced my reading experience even further. As this story goes on though, it likely references past encounters with this button box, but I do wish I had read very quickly the other two books first. Anyway, this time Gwendy, at the age of 67, a successful novelist and rising political star, she finds herself facing the ominous return of the dangerous button box. Her last mission is to dispose of the malevolent button box in outer space, a task assigned by the enigmatic Richard Barris. However, sinister forces seem determined to prevent her from fulfilling her duty since her possession of the box tragedy has never been far from her life with the loss of her husband in a hit and run accident and Gwendy herself begins to grapple with the early signs of Alzheimer's and once she gets into her space shuttle she gets news that a house has actually been set on fire. The toll of the holders of the button box in the past has driven them either mad or to their deaths by whispering and tempting them to just press the button to end the world in some form by a mere push sinister societies want the box for their own evil deeds and this time they sent a crew member to stop Gwendy's plans of putting the box where no one can ever get to it again in space the Paul Bearers Club. Now, I did read this some time ago using both book and audio, and I really did enjoy the mixed experience with this. The novel is written by our main character, Art, but it has been proofread by one of his friends. No, actually, his only friend, Mercy. Mercy has handwritten the notes in the book, whereas she is the has an actual voice in the audio book. So this is written as a kind of memoir, although Mercy does note several times that this is not his memoir since it's mostly fiction in her eyes. The novel is cleverly written as Art's memoir with Mercy offering her own commentary along the way, sometimes disagreeing with Art's version of events. The story re revolves around Art, a teenager in the 1980s who starts the Paul Bearers Club at his school. Things change when Mercy, an equally unique girl with an interest in strange things, joins the club. The atmosphere was creepy and the friendship between Art and Mercy was one of the highlights. The unique horror elements ran beautifully with real life situations. Being set in the 1980s, I also enjoyed the nostalgic references. There is a spooky underlying story being told about a New England vampire, a local urban legend that becomes an obsession for them both. Seeking out the truth to whether Art's Mercy Brown is the Mercy Brown, the vampire of the legend. The supernatural theme adds depth and leaves room for interpretation, making you question what is real? Who is telling the truth? Is it Art or Mercy? And then a book I read just recently, Echo by Thomas Old Huvelt. The I loved the beginning of this book. It was very creepy about a woman awaiting her friends to get to the isolated snowed in cabin when she is awoken with a need to go to the toilet. But when she peers down the dark landing, she sees a mass of faces staring back at her. Totally unsettling. I think this is going to be the best book ever, but it doesn't work out that way. Instead, I found it repetitive and very slow. The actual story of the book is about Sam, who is dating Nick. Sam gets the terrifying call that Nick has been in a climbing accident with his hiking partner, Augustine. Augustine's body was never found though. And when he gets to the hospital, he's told Nick's face is completely shattered. The official report is that it was an avalanche which caused a fall on the rocks but piecing together overheard conversations Sam believes that something else has happened. They both spiral mentally in completely different ways. Nick becomes unhinged as the result of what he remembers from the accident and Sam from the thought of a new life with whatever lurks under Nick's bandages. I just didn't vibe with this novel at all and then the last book up for the award was Road of Bones by Christopher Golden and this was the shortest book out of the whole list with just a 230 pages long 
but it packed a lot into this book. It was a terrifying folk horror set in the desolate Kolyma Highway of Siberia, a place that can fall to reportedly minus 60 degrees. This is one of those atmospheric horrors that drags you into the story until you feel the cold seeping into your bones. You feel the isolation and the darkness. The story follows Teague and his best friend Prentice, two documentary filmmakers who travel to Siberia to investigate the legend of the Road of Bones. They soon find themselves in over their heads as they encounter a series of terrifying events. They are stranded in the middle of nowhere, attacked by wolves and pursued by a mysterious creature from Russian folklore. The characters in this book are superbly written, having very little dialogue and the scenery being just so scarce it just worked to its advantage in the development of the story the dread is real the wilderness is written in such a way that it is truly terrifying and unforgettable how one mistake or one extra minute outside could result in the loss of a body part if not death whether from the elements or whatever is waiting for you in the darkness. It was simply a fantastic folk horror that I was so surprised I haven't heard more about. Before I go on to anything else, I can say that yes, I had a couple of duds in this list, but I had an amazing time reading the majority of them. Some of them I had chosen to read and some I would not have read if it had not been for them being on this or the Stoker shortlist. And for that, I am truly grateful for. So out of the 11 that I read for this, I gave the following four stars or over, which to me is high praise indeed. Sundial, The Devil Takes You Home, Just Like Home and Road of Bones. But who do I want to win? Well, I wanted Gabino to win the Bram Stoker Award and he did. So I really want to pick somebody else for this. So I'm going to say Christopher Golden, I really enjoyed Road of Bones. It was my very first experience reading one of their books and I loved it. Now, as I explained last time, who I think should win is probably not who I think will win. So I do think, again, Sundial will win. Just like I said before, this is purely because I think that this book had a lot more traction. So shall we see who did win? I'm going to find the ceremony on my phone and get to the all-important announcement. What Moves the Dead by T. Kingfisher of High Fire <laughs> Okay then, so there you go. T. Kingfisher, What Moves the Dead was the winner of the Locus Awards for the horror category of 2023. As I said, it wasn't one of my favourites, but who am I to go against the voting public? Very deserving, of course, whether I thought it was the best book of last year or not. What do you think? Have you read any of these books? Which do you think should have won? What do you think of award ceremonies in general? Do you actually take notice if a book wins something or not? Are you more likely to re read the winning book or from that author again? Let me know. Thank you all so much for watching as always. Thank you for spending your time with me today. Don't forget to like this video if you did and subscribe if you haven't already. Make some good book choices this week, my friends, and I hope to see you all again soon. Until next time, bye-bye-bye.